Hi everybody, more Harry Potter reading. Um, I was at the very end of the of a chapter when the video cut me off. We have a strict 15 minute time limit on the videos. Um, but what happened was Harry had run into Cornelius Fudge, the minister of magic. So that would be like running into the president. And he had dinner with Harry and he told Harry not to worry about having done magic outside of school, which Harry thought was weird, that he wasn't getting punished or anything. So something strange is happening. And he set Harry up to sleep in a hotel for the night. So the manager of the hotel took Harry upstairs and Hedwig was there waiting for him. So that's where we are right now. Um, Harry sat on his bed for a long time, absentmindedly stroking Hedwig. The sky outside the window was changing rapidly from deep velvety blue to cold steely gray and then slowly to pink shot with gold. Harry could hardly believe that he'd left Privet Drive only a few hours ago that he wasn't expelled, and that he was now facing two completely dursley free weeks. It's been a very weird night, Hedwig, he yawned, and without even removing his glasses, he slumped back onto his pillows and fell asleep. So now I'm on the beginning of chapter four, if you happen to have the book at home. This is what the picture looks like. Chapter four, The Leaky Cauldron, and that's on page 49. It took Harry several days to get used to his strange new freedom. Never before had he been able to get up whenever he wanted or eat whatever he wanted. He could even go wherever he pleased, as long as it was in Diagon Alley, and as this long cobbled street was packed with the most fascinating wizarding shops in the world, Harry felt no desire to break his word to fudge and stray back into the muggle world. Harry ate breakfast each morning in the leaky cauldron, where he liked watching the other guests. Funny little witches from the country up for a day's shopping. Venerable-looking wizards arguing over the latest article in Transfiguration Today. Wild-looking warlocks, raucous dwarfs, and once what looked suspiciously like a hag who ordered a plate of raw liver from behind a thick woolen balaclava. After breakfast, Harry would go out into the backyard, take out his wand, tap the third brick from the left above the trash bin, and stand back as the archway into Diagon Alley opened in the wall. Harry spent the long sunny days exploring the shops and eating under the brightly colored umbrellas outside cafes, where his fellow diners were showing one another their purchases. It's a lunoscope, old boy. No more messing around with moon charts, see? Or else discussing the case of Sirius Black. Personally, I won't let any of the children out alone until he's back in Azkaban. Harry didn't have to do his homework under the blankets by flashlight anymore. Now he could sit in the bright sunshine outside Florian Fortescue's ice cream parlor, finishing all his essays with occasional help from Florian Fortescue himself, who, apart from knowing a great deal about medieval witch burnings, gave Harry free Sundays every half an hour. Once Harry had refilled his money bag with gold galleons, silver sickles, and bronze newts from his vault at Gringotts, he had to exercise a lot of self-control not to spend the whole lot at once. He had to keep reminding himself that he had five years to go at Hogwarts and how it would feel to ask the Dursleys for money for spell books, to stop himself from buying a handsome set of solid gold gobstones, a wizarding game rather like marbles, in which the stones squirt a nasty-smelling liquid into the other player's face when they lose a point. He was sorely tempted, too, by the perfect moving model of the galaxy in a large glass ball, which would have meant he never had to take another astronomy lesson. But the thing that tested Harry's resolution most appeared in his favorite shop, Quality Quidditch Supplies, a week after he'd arrived at the Leaky Cauldron. Curious to know what the crowd in the shop was staring at, Harry edged his way inside and squeezed in among the excited witches and wizards until he glimpsed a newly erected podium on which was mounted the most magnificent broom he had ever seen in his life. Just come out, prototype! A square-jawed wizard was telling his companion. It's the fastest broom in the world, isn't it, Dad? Squeaked a boy younger than Harry, who was swinging off his father's arm. Irish International Sides just put in an order for seven of these beauties, the proprietor of the shop told the crowd, and they're favorites for the World Cup. A large witch in front of Harry moved, and he was able to read the sign next to the broom. The Firebolt! This state-of-the-art racing broom sports a streamlined, superfine handle of ash, treated with a diamond-hard polish and hand-numbered with its own registration number. 
Each individually selected birch twig in the broomtail has been honed to aerodynamic perfection, giving the firebolt unsurpassable balance and pinpoint precision. The firebolt has an acceleration of 150 miles an hour in 10 seconds and incorporates an unbreakable braking charm. Price on request. Price on request? Harry didn't like to think how much gold the firebolt would cost. He had never wanted anything as much in his whole life, but had he had never lost a Quidditch match on his Nimbus 2000. And what was the point in emptying his Gringotts vault for the firebolt when he had a very good broom already? Harry didn't ask for the price, but he returned almost every day after that just to look at the firebolt. There were, however, things that Harry needed to buy. He went to the apothecary to replenish his store of potions ingredients, and as his school robes were now several inches too short in the arm and leg, he visited Madame Malcolm's robes for all occasions and bought new ones. Most important of all, he had to buy his new school books, which would include those for his two new subjects, Care of Magical Creatures and Divination. Harry got a surprise as he looked in at the bookshop window. Instead of the usual display of gold-embossed spell books the size of paving slabs, there was a large iron cage behind the glass that held about a hundred copies of the Monster Book of Monsters. Torn pages were flying everywhere as the books grappled with each other, locked together in furious wrestling matches and snapping aggressively. Harry pulled his book list out of his pocket and consulted it for the first time. The Monster Book of Monsters was listed as the required book for Care of Magical Creatures class. Now Harry understood why Hagrid had said it would come in useful. He felt relieved. He had been wondering whether Hagrid wanted to help, help with some terrifying new pet. As Harry entered Flourish and Blots, the manager came hurrying toward him. Hogwarts, he said abruptly, come to get your new books? Yes, said Harry. I need... Get out of the way, said the manager impatiently, brushing Harry aside. He drew on a pair of very thick gloves, picked up a large, knobbly walking stick, and proceeded toward the door of the monster book's cage. Hang on, said Harry quickly. I've already got one of those. Have you? A look of enormous relief spread over the manager's face. Thank heavens for that. I've been bitten five times already this morning. A loud ripping noise rent the air. Two of the monster books had seized a third and were pulling it apart. Stop it! Stop it! cried the manager, poking the walking stick through the bars and knocking the books apart. I'm never stocking them again, never. It's been bedlam. I thought we'd seen the worst when we bought 200 copies of the Invisible Book of Invisibility. Cost a fortune, and we never found them. Well, is there anything else I can help you with? Yes, said Harry, looking down his book list. I need Unfogging the Future by Cassandra Vablotsky. Ah, starting divination, are you? said the manager, stripping off his gloves and leading Harry into the back of the shop, where there was a corner devoted to fortune-telling. A small table was stacked with volumes, such as Predicting the Unpredictable, Insulate Yourself Against Shocks, and Brokenness When Fortunes Turn Foul. Here you are, said the manager, who had climbed a set of steps to take down a thick black-bound book, Unfogging the Future, Very Good Guide to All Your Basic Fortune-Telling Methods. Palmistry, crystal balls, bird entrails. But Harry wasn't listening. His eyes had fallen on another book, which was among a display on a small table. Death Omens, What to Do When You Know the Worst is Coming. Oh, I wouldn't read that if I were you, said the manager lightly, looking to see what Harry was staring at. You'll start seeing death omens everywhere. It's enough to frighten anyone to death. But Harry continued to stare at the front cover of the book. It showed a black dog large as a bear with gleaming eyes it looked oddly familiar the manager pressed unfogging the future into harry's hands anything else he said yes said harry tearing his eyes away from the dogs and dazedly consulting his book list uh i need intermediate transfiguration and the standard book of spells grade three harry emerged from flourish and blots ten minutes later with his new books under his arms and made his way back to the leaky cauldron, hardly noticing where he was going and bumping into several people. He tramped up the stairs to his room, went inside, and tipped his books onto his bed. Somebody had been in to tidy up. The windows were open, and the sun was pouring inside. Harry could hear the buses rolling by in the unseen Muggle Street behind him, and the sound of the invisible crowd below in Diagon Alley. He caught sight of himself in the mirror over the basin. 
It can't have been a death omen, he told his reflection defiantly. I was panicking when I saw that thing in Magnolia Crescent. It was probably just a stray dog. He raised his hand automatically and tried to make his hair lie flat. You're fighting a losing battle there, dear, said his mirror in a wheezy voice. As the day slipped by, Harry started looking wherever he went for a sign of Ron or Hermione. Plenty of Hogwarts students were arriving at Diagon Alley now, with the start of term so near. Harry met Seamus Finnegan and Dean Thomas, his fellow Gryffindors, in quality Quidditch supplies, where they too were ogling the firebolt. He also ran into the real Neville Longbottom, a round-faced forgetful boy, outside Flourish and Blots. Harry didn't stop to chat. Neville appeared to have mislaid his book list and was being told off by his very formidable-looking grandmother. Harry hoped she never found out that he'd pretended to be Neville while on the run from the Ministry of Magic. Harry woke on the last day of the holidays thinking that he would at least meet Ron and Hermione tomorrow on the Hogwarts Express. He got up, dressed, went for a last look at the firebolt, and was just wondering where he'd have lunch when someone yelled his name and he turned. Harry! Harry! They were there, both of them, sitting outside Florian Fortescue's ice cream parlor, Ron looking incredibly freckly, Hermione very brown, both waving frantically at him. Finally, said Ron, grinning at Harry as he sat down. We went to the leaky cauldron, but they said you'd left, and we went to Flourish and Blots and Madame Malkin's, and I got all my school stuff last week, Harry explained, and how come you knew I'm staying at the leaky cauldron? Dad, said Ron simply. Mr. Weasley, who worked at the Ministry of Magic, would of course have heard the whole story of what had happened to Aunt Marge. Did you really blow up your aunt, Harry? said Hermione in a very serious voice. I didn't mean to, said Harry, while Ron roared with laughter. I just lost control. It's not funny, Ron, said Hermione sharply. Honestly, I'm amazed Harry wasn't expelled. So am I, admitted Harry. Forget expelled, I thought I was going to be arrested. He looked at Ron. Your dad doesn't know why Fudge let me off, does he? Probably because it's you, isn't it? Shrugged Ron, still chuckling. Famous Harry Potter and all that? I'd hate to see what the ministry do to me if I blew up a knot. Mind you, they'd have to dig me up first because Mum would have killed me. Anyway, you can ask Dad yourself this evening. We're staying at the Leaky Cauldron tonight, too. So you can come to King's Cross with us tomorrow. Hermione's there as well. Hermione nodded, beaming. Mum and Dad dropped me off this morning with all my Hogwarts things. Excellent, said Harry happily. So have you got all your new books and stuff? Look at this, said Ron, pulling a long, long thin box out of a bag and opening it. Brand new wand. Fourteen inches. Willow containing one unicorn tail hair, and we've got all our books. He pointed at a large bag under his chair. What about those monster books, huh? The assistant nearly cried when we said we wanted two. What's all that, Hermione? Harry asked, pointing at not one, but three bulging bags in the chair next to her. Well, I'm taking more new subjects than you, aren't I? said Hermione. Those are my books for arithmancy, care of magical creatures, divination, the study of ancient runes, muggle studies. What are you doing muggle studies for? said Ron, rolling his eyes at Harry. You're muggle-born. Your mom and dad are muggles. You already know all about muggles. But it'll be fascinating to study them from the wizarding point of view, said Hermione earnestly. Are you planning to eat or sleep at all this year, Hermione? asked Harry while Ron sniggered. Hermione ignored them. I've still got ten galleons, she said, checking her purse. It's my birthday in September, and Mum and Dad gave me some money to get myself an early birthday present. How about a nice book? said Ron innocently. No, I don't think so, said Hermione composedly. I really want an owl. I mean, Harry's got Hedwig, and you've got Errol. I haven't, said Ron. Errol's a family owl. All I've got is Scabbers, my rat. He pulled his pet rat out of his pocket, and I want to get him checked over, he added, placing Scabbers on the table in front of him. I don't think Egypt agreed with him. Scabbers was looking thinner than usual, and there was a definite droop to his whiskers. There's a magical creature shop just over there, said Harry, who knew Diagon Alley very well by now. You could see if they've got anything for Scabbers, and Hermione can get herself an owl. So they paid for their ice cream and crossed the street to the magical menagerie. Okay, guys, we're almost at 15 minutes, so I'm going to stop there. I stopped on page 58. See you next time.